This time on the show, 50 gigs of free online web storage, building a high performance home firewall and router from scratch, and someone thought it would be a good idea to let me play with power tools. Stick around, I'm Darren Kitchen, you're watching Hack 5. This episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com, GoToAssist Express, and Netflix. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen and this is your weekly dose of Technolust. First and foremost, you guys will notice that the audio is significantly better. I think it could still improve, but uh, thank you for bearing with the last episode where I was shooting with the shotgun mic. Got the new cams in, can't wait to take them, well next week, to LA for E3! Yes! Video games! It's going to be awesome. But today, well, if you're going to video a game, you got to make sure you've got some really good performance with your tubes. I mean, I'm, I'm saying, you know, little chintzy plastic routers. This one's actually not too terrible because it's a Finera. This is the, uh, the 2.0 N, not the G. So it's not nearly as fun as far as Wi-Fi hacking is concerned. But if you're a gamer, you don't want one of these. No, no. You need some good ping times. You need some quality of service so that you can see what else is out there on your network that might be potentially slowing down you getting those headshots in modern warfare too and you know we, we wouldn't want any lag so we are going to go ahead and build ourselves a badass router today and much like we did last week with the virtualization server which is totally rocking over there uh, we're going to build a new one now this one is going to be based on a mini itx and we're going to well I spoke with legal and they said that if I promised to be very, very, very good, they'd let me play with the power tools. So stay tuned for that. But now let's just go ahead and head over to Shannon and find out about this week's trivia. This week's trivia is, while Tux the Penguin may be the official Linux mascot, Larry the Cow is the unofficial mascot of which Linux distribution? Enter for your chance to win some killer new Hack5 stickers by going over to hack5.org slash trivia. Now a brief word from one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Paul, could you give me a hand? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh. What's with the rubber duckies? Oh, it's my latest great idea. And what are you doing with all the smoke detectors? Oh, those are for the americium. The radioactive isotope. Yeah, I did a bunch of research. Back in the day during World War II, there was this dude like Glenn Seaborg or something, and he was like bombarding plutonium with these neutrons and totally discovered this stuff, and, and now you can get in fire smoke detector dealies. What's that got to do with the rubber duckies? Oh man, radioactive rubber duckies. What? Well, they only put like a third of a microgram in the smoke detector, but I totally found a way to buy them wholesale and extract this stuff real easy. What are you gonna do with a radioactive rubber ducky? What else, man? Take a bath with gamma radiation. That is the worst idea I've ever heard. No, it's the best idea ever, and that's why I've already registered RadioactiveRubberDuckies.com! I hope you didn't spend a lot of money on that. <laughs> no, dude. Domain was super cheap. You gotta go to Domain.com, check out with coupon code HACK5, you get 15% off. Whether your next great idea is radioactive rubber duckies or something a little more practical, it all starts with a great domain. And Domain.com is our number one go-to place for great hosting and domain name registration. Hosting plans start at just $5.75 a month and include one-click installs of popular open source programs like WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, and more. Features like unlimited traffic and free website builders with unlimited pages are what makes Domain.com the easy and affordable place to get your sites online. So get started today and take 15% off your order when you check out with coupon code HAK5. Got a great idea? It all starts with a great domain. Domain.com Alright, so I figured let's just go ahead and break this project down into two separate parts. First, let's go ahead and focus on the hardware and then we'll have a lot of fun with the software. Now, as far as the hardware is concerned, I'm going to be using one of these guys. Mini ITX boards are awesome. You can find them relatively inexpensive and, uh, and you know, enough power to run a router easily. I mean, think about the fact that in one of these guys, just some 
classic router, you'll find that your big box store is going to have something like a MIPS or an ARM processor that is going to be completely underpowered with not enough RAM. And just imagine the difference when you start using some real hardware. Now this mini ITX and uh, this one here that we'll be using later today is, uh, these are Intel Atom chips, the same kind of chips that you're going to find in your netbook PCs. So, you know, a 1.3 or a 1.6 gigahertz machine, a little bit of hyper threading, toss in two gigs of RAM because, dude, if you can do it right, just go ahead and overkill. And uh, yeah, you just pop some nicks in and you're away to the races. But it's not gonna look as sexy as one of these little plastic pieces. So I figure, you know, in the spirit of in the new place, uh, hanging servers on walls as we have last week, let's just go ahead and have some more fun with some plexiglass with some acrylic, if you will, and, uh, and build ourselves a nice platform that we can begin to stack some mini ITX machines on, and, uh, and I figured that'd be fun. So let's take a look at your inventory hardware. What are we working with? Well, I've gone ahead and recycled a parallel ATA drive. It happens to be a 250 gig, uh, but you know, anything like a couple gigs or more is going to do. I, I even have a 13 gig lane over there. My God. <laughs> uh, and then, like I said, this is a mini ITX form factor motherboard here. It's um, your Intel Atom chip, right? Now I've gone ahead and you'll notice, let me just rip this out. You'll notice we have, you know, plenty of USB, but only a single NIC. That is going to be an issue with building a router. We're going to need two NICs, obviously, because one is going to go to our cable or DSL or what have you, and the other is going to go to our network switch, which will power the rest of the devices. Now, for this particular router, I'm not concerned with doing wireless. That is a separate project that we're going to have a lot more fun with in the weeks to come. But uh, suffice it to say, you're going to need two NICs. Now, while this does have a real tech on board, which for the most part is going to be supported by the mainstream um, router distributions that we'll be playing with, like your PFSense or your mono wall or your, well, my favorite, smooth wall, uh, you, you do need to make sure that whatever NIC that you do find on your onboard, on your uh, little mini ITX here, that uh, you want to check your distribution's compatibility list because you know, if it's not listed, then, then you might run into some fun issues there. Uh, another neat aspect about this particular board is that we're actually rocking so dims here, some little laptop RAM, which is pretty cool, whereas this newer guy is actually using some, uh, you know, your, your generic sticks of, I think this is DDR2, two gigs. I love that, overkill for a router. That's the way to do it. So, come on, well, Futs with that later. Anyway, another kind of neat thing is you can pick up one of these and and uh, it wants to come out here. This right here is just your standard header for your motherboard, and it plugs into DC. So what that means is we don't have to have an ugly honking power supply sitting on the uh, the side of our machine. That's going to give us a lot more room to play with here on our piece of plexi and. Yes, we do get a single Molex and a single uh, uh, whatever that SATA power connector is called, but, uh, but there you go. So we have essentially everything we need, uh, so let's just go ahead and put it together. Now as far as the case is concerned, I have seen a lot of mini ITX cases that uh, some of them are, are you know, kind of cute, but why, why pay for something where you could just take some pieces of scrap material and, and put it together? So this right here is quarter inch acrylic. Um, this happens to be black for extra sexiness, but you know, anything's gonna work. And what I w the idea here is that I'm gonna chop this in half, which should be the right size for this motherboard. And then I'm going to recess the hard drive in the top layer. So I'm gonna stick this here and I'm going to make a cutout so that it can sit recessed. And then I'll go ahead with my trusty Sharpie, mark all the points here for the holes for the motherboard to go ahead and fit there and the holes for the bottom, there are four screws in the bottom of our hard drive and that will allow me to go ahead and seat everything and, and then to just kind of tease a little bit into the future. What that allows us to do is uh, with these little riser guys, where'd you guys go? Here, I'll just steal one off this to show you. So with our little risers here, what that's going to allow us to do is 
lift the board up significantly off of this acrylic here so that we'll be able to fit our hard drive underneath and using either some you know, long machine screws or even more risers, we, we will eventually be able to do is take another similar mini ITX great form factor board and start stacking them. Yes, it's a Beowulf cluster of goodness up in here. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you can go ahead and place your bets right now on injuries, that's fine. Uh, and begin by measuring a couple of times and then making our marks, our cuts, and what have you. And I'm just going to go ahead and speed all of this up in post to make it look like I know what I'm doing. How's that? Of course, it's nearly seven inches by seven inches as it should be. And I've got about eight inches by 14 and a half to work with. So I'll cut this at ooh, 14 and a half. That's not as much as I wanted. That means uh, seven and a quarter. Well, in that case, scrap that new piece of plexi and I'm just going to cut it to however I want it. In which case, let's give us about an inch on either side. I think that's gonna look good. It's gonna be a nice little tower to sit in the kitchen and look sexy all day long. And of course, I do want to make sure that I have proper safety stuff going on so I don't hurt myself. How's that? And as you can see, my cut <laughs> doesn't go completely perfectly with my line. And that's because I only measured that, uh, that it met my line at the beginning and not at the end. And this is why I typically don't do hardware. But hey, you know, you live and you learn. But, you know, we're mounting a mini ITX to a, uh, to a piece of plexi. I don't think I'm going to uh, lose my merit badge for this. So if I were going to try to do this again and do it right, I don't know, it looks right to me, but then again, I might not have drawn my line exactly square either. So, all right, let's go ahead and take our bets now. This was just eyeballing it. Did we make a perfect square? Well, let's see. Nine, <laughs> nope, okay, nope. I was very, 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 very close. I was within like, I don't know, how many of these are there? I was in one lot of, of. <laughs> yeah. But I'm pretty close to square, so I'm going to go ahead and make an X on this with my marker from corner to corner. Now I'll go ahead and take my motherboard and I'm going to place it right there in the middle. And what you'll notice is that the edges here go ahead and line up so that I can actually easily center this. Now I'm not gonna break out the ruler again because it's not that big of a deal, but I think that's pretty center. What about you? So I'm gonna go ahead and make my marks, placing a little dot here. A little dot here. Oh good, I can see those pretty well. Excellent. So now I just need to drill some holes so that I can actually put, well, what would be my risers, but we might be changing things up just a bit, so. You want to make sure that you don't get one of these perpetually shrinking motherboards or else your screws aren't going to line up. But that's an easy fix. I think I, I, this one, if I just nudge it over just a bit, we should be all set. By the way, if you are a uh, carpenter or otherwise handyman um, and you would like to go ahead and berate me via email, that's Darren at Hack5. 
org. All right, so let's go ahead and get into mounting our motherboard. And typically what I would like to do is just use you know, the, the regular motherboard risers that would come with your case or you know, maybe some longer ones. These are what you would pick up at well, wherever you buy your computer parts. Or we can go ahead and use these. These are three inch uh, machine bolts that have the same thread that you would find on your riser. And that will give us enough space here to go ahead and get our um, to get our there's a word for it hard drive underneath. So go ahead and just pop these guys in. Ah! You're a flathead. You're a flathead. Really? You're not a you're a Phillips head. You're a flathead. You guys don't love each other. No. Now I'm going to go ahead and put a nut on each of these and take them all the way down, down to the ground. Zoom tight. Take me down, six on the ground, the ground beneath my feet. Okay. Yeah, I don't think those are going to go anywhere. So now, pretty sure, should just be able to slide this right on. And hey, look at that. They, uh, they want to line up now. Amazing. Okay, cool. Now, obviously it's gonna fall down, so let's go ahead and pop two nuts in each of these so that they'll lock with each other. And uh, that way, our motherboard won't sag. Nobody wants a sagging motherboard. I'm going to take my hard drive and I'm pretty much going to want the hard drive to sit here underneath while the motherboard sits on top. So it looks like I got quite a bit of room to work with here. I should go ahead and figure out how I'm mounting this, uh, this hard drive. In that case I can either pop some screws in here and then run some more um, machine bolts through from the bottom because there are, are four little screw holes here on the bottom of our hard drive, and that's one option. Now this isn't, you know, this isn't wall mounted. This isn't going to sit sideways anywhere. So, you know, I'm not too worried about the hard drive moving around a whole lot. Uh, let me see what other screws I have to work with here. I think these, these should be the right size here to go through both the uh, acrylic and right into the uh, bottom of the hard drive. And yes, they're a perfect fit. Now the question is, Am I going to be able to uh, get that perfect? Because these need to be these need to be dead on. So it's probably a uh, a fancy way of doing this, but uh, I don't know the trick. The trick now is to set that down and make my points with my marker. Or if you have a girlfriend, or if you have as, if you're as lucky as I am to have a Colleen behind a camera. You can borrow some makeup. Thank you, Colleen. And we're just going to take some of this concealer or whatever this is and just dab a little bit on each of our screws. I guess you could use toothpaste as well if you don't have access to makeup. Or maybe you want to start wearing makeup. I mean, you know, I'm not judging. I'm just saying. It can be used for computer stuff too. Yeah, just give it a little bit of pressure and pull that right up and I can clear as day see. I don't know if that's going to come out on the camera as well, but, you, but I've got my little marks here, so I'm going to go over those with my Sharpie. I'm just going to let you know ahead right now, if you're absolutely not coordinated, don't bother. Just buy a case. But if you're absolutely not coordinated and uh, have an obligation to make a 30 minute technology program on a weekly basis, well then just go ahead. There we go. 
you know, now I've, I've just got it kind of like leaning back, you know? And that's just because it's, uh, well, it's from the, the East Bay. So that's, this, that's how the motherboards rock around here. We're just gonna leave that for now. And our Molex power to the hard drive. Has anyone ever said measure once, cut twice? Um. <laughs> oh my god. My Molex power connector doesn't reach the hard drive. Epic fail. So there we go. I took five minutes to go ahead and, and make it sexy, and now everything should line up. I've gone ahead and removed the, uh, the cover here so you can actually see the gorgeous black acrylic that we do have here. If I had a little bit more room, I'd pop one of these sexy Hack 5 stickers on it, which are guaranteed to improve overclocking performance. But uh, as it is, I think as a router, it's gonna do fine without it. So let me just go ahead and hook up my IDEs. And this guy is set to master. It's been so long since I've used IDE, but you know, I don't have any spare SATA drives. So go figure. Right, there's a little key for a reason. And I think I may want to just go ahead and trim this cable. Oh, here we go. Let's take this IDE cable and since I'm only ever going to have one device on the chain, snip off the excess. Don't need that. And uh, you know, if Wes were here we would trim these and turn it into a rounded IDE cable and play with cable management but we're not going to do that because then the server would turn evil and we can't have any of that. Excellent. Now, you may notice that I do not have a power switch and that is because I've gone into the BIOS and set it to automatically come on when it gets power. So really all I need to do is plug some DC into here and it should be all set. So let's give it some VGA loving and I've got a USB keyboard here and we'll go ahead and give it some power. Now it's a fanless, so the only way I can tell, that's exactly it. I don't know if you heard that beep. Uh, that's the reason that the PC speaker is connected. And there we go. I missed the BIOS. It happens. Uh, boot disk failure because we do not have an operating system on here, but we will hear shortly. We're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we're going to be popping Smoothwall on here and configuring it so that we're going to have a very sexy network to get some high performance gaming and other fun interneting on, if you will. So stay tuned, stick around, we'll be back in just a bit. This week I have some innovative online storage solutions for you because, well, let's face it, local backups are only going to get you so far, and unless you want to ship hard drives to your Nana every week of those pictures that she really wants of you and the kids, well, a true off-site backup solution isn't very commonplace. Oh, it sucks. There are services like Dropbox and SugarSync, which give you about two gigs of space, but that kind of reminds me of my GeoCities days when I only had like two megs of space for all of my Sailor Moon pictures from my fan site. Woo-woo! Yeah, not much space. Uh, yeah, Sailor Moon fan site. Pretend you didn't hear that. So, we have services that go up to like 50 gigs if you're willing to contribute to them. And one of those that I really like is Wooala. Alright, I gotta thank JPEG real quick for sending this in. It's an awesome program, everybody can use it. Wooala.com, which was made by Lacey or Lacey. Wait, that's kind of like Final Fantasy 13, right? <laughs> the Lacey made Wooala. Awesome. <laughs> God, I'm such a dork. All right, you can store basically gigs of data up in the cloud and it's just for your priceless materials like your pictures and your documents and videos and music. Well, all right, maybe not music because, you know, we can all replace that, right? Shh, pretend I didn't say anything. And the cool thing about Wooala is that you don't necessarily have to pay for more storage. You do have the ability to trade storage on your local machine for storage up in the cloud, which is pretty cool. There's tons of features. First of all, it's ad-free, which is great. You have the ability to do private, you can do shared and public modes. 
So if you want to do everything private so only you can see it, shared with your friends and family, or public so like your coworkers and everybody at work can see whatever files you put up. You also have personal folders and you can add to and join groups. There's secure file storage. Everything you do on here is encrypted, so even the Wuala team can't see anything that you're doing. They have no clue what kind of files you're putting up there. It's awesome. Pro users get a version control, and if you don't want to necessarily share your whole hard drive with others, there's a paid version. It's $25 per year or 10 gigs, and it's up to $1,000 a year for a terabyte. But really, if you have a whole terabyte that you need to put up on the cloud, you might as well get Amazon S3 storage if you don't need to upload and download really frequently. Wuala runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and thanks to GoToAssist Express, I'm able to do a really, really simple setup using one of our Hack5 Cloud Lab computers, so let's check that out. Alright, so I've already opened up the Wuala website. I'm going to click the Download tab, and Wuala should start downloading automatically. There it goes. Yay! Alright, once the EXE is done, I choose the EXE, I choose Run, click next a few times, and the installation begins. And once the, the installation is finished, I'm gonna choose to go ahead and start Wuala and stick it on my desktop so it's easily findable. All right, so my Windows firewall is gonna pop up. Yeah, I'm gonna allow access. And then I'm gonna put in my new sign-in info, so my username, snubs, yay. My email, snubs at high5.org, I can spell, yay. My password and then Wuala will start. Okay, so it's telling me I need to update Wuala, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that, run the setup. Wuala automatically starts up, and then I type in my password. Okay, now I'm in Wuala, yay! Now, right now it's telling me I only have one gig of cloud storage. I can also trade in for local space, or I can buy more space, or invite friends for up to three gigs. Oh, that's cool, okay. I'm going to create a new folder called Hack5 in the Images folder. To upload a picture, I simply click Add Files, choose my image, and open it. And then once the image is uploaded, it'll, it's going to have a little green bullet right next to the file. If the file shows up gray, that means it hasn't been uploaded yet. And if there's a taskbar type thing next to it, that means that it's working on being uploaded. To change the privacy settings of a folder, right click and go to Properties. Change the visibility by clicking Change, and then choose Private, Shared, or Public. I'm going to go ahead and choose Shared, and then I can select All Friends. Since I don't have any friends yet, just picking All Friends is going to make sure that all of my friends in the future will be able to see this, this folder. I can change that in the future if I need to. Uh, if you did have a whole bunch of friends listed in here, they would show up in this pop-up, and then you could choose which ones that you wanted to have visible to this folder. There's also a couple of other features that I did want to point out right now because they're pretty cool. I can find my friends through various services like Yahoo or whatnot and I can join a group. To join a group you simply search for the group. I want to join an anime group so I'm going to type in anime. There's a ton of them here. Alright so I'm just going to choose one by hitting this little green button next to the image. I click yes and now I'm a member. Yeah. Now I can add to the group a whole bunch of images that I have on my computer from anime or I can download straight from it, which is nice. So you can see, once you start playing with Wuala, it's really easy and it's fast and quick and painless. Now all of your essential files are now backed up onto the cloud using industry standard encryption. Woo! I love backups, almost as much as I love my portable apps. It's a shame this isn't really a portable app. So, do you use this? Feedback at hack5.org. I think you know the deal. And I would like to thank GoToAssist Express for making this Snubs report possible. Their computer, your brain. How do you get the two together without wasting time and money traveling? Use GoToAssist Express to view and control your customer's computer online so you can fix the problem on the spot. Save time and money on travel. Satisfy customers quickly and efficiently. Then move on to other tasks. Try GoToAssist Express free for 30 days. For this special offer, you must visit gotoassist.com slash hack5. That's gotoassist.com slash hack5 for a free trial. Find more great tips like these at revision3.com slash gotoassist express. All right, we've got our hardware all set up, and it's time to start putting together all the bits and bytes that are actually going to make this gorgeous hunk of junk here into our sexy 
router that is going to perform oh so much better than any piece of plastic that you can find at the big box store. Now, I've gone ahead and set up our network interfaces here. The Intel NIC here, this is actually a, a Pro 1000 GT, one of my favorite NICs, uh, is going to run as our green interface or our network interface for our uh, local area network here. So it's going to plug into our switch. I've got it connected directly to my laptop here, just to test with, and then our integrated, which is a real tech, is plugged into a really long cable that is heading to the, uh, the new Doxis 3 modem, where we've got a, a little 30 megabit down, 10 megabit up happiness going on. Um, and to make the installation really easy, rather than, you know, futzing with any USB drives or anything like that, I've gone ahead and just grabbed a USB external CD-ROM drive since really we're only going to be using optical for installing our media anyway and well, it seems like that's really how it is these days anyway. So let's go ahead and get started. Just download the ISO for your favorite router distribution. Mine happens to be Smoothwall. Uh, I've also been playing with PFSense which looks really nice especially if you want to do an embedded system where you want to boot your router off of just a USB drive, uh, they have embedded ISOs that you can just use like FizzDisk Write to really just image that bin file over to, or the uh, IMG file over to your USB media, whether it be 5, 12, a gig to 4 gigs. And, um, and the entire operating system and everything will live there and it will be read only so that you don't need to worry about you know, the longevity of your USB drive. However, I'm going with a 250 gig drive, which is overkill, but then again, so is the two gigs of RAM and the 1.6 gigahertz. Point being, I'm running Smoothwall because that's going to allow me with the hard drive there to go ahead and run some additional features down the road like a real-time antivirus and some quality of services and uh, you know a web caching proxy like Squid so that if I fetch, I don't know, some obscure Microsoft knowledge base article and then somebody else down the line wants it as well, well, it's locally cached, you know. So, so that's going to speed performance up in that regard. Um, so I've gone ahead, downloaded the ISO, burned it to a CD. Let's boot up. And as I said before, it's just a matter of connecting the power here. And auto boots, that's exactly what I want it to do. So if the power goes out, the machine will come right back on. I'm going to pop right into the BIOS here for just a sec and make sure that I've got it set up the way I want. And our first boot device is our CD-ROM. So that's what I need to make sure of. So I can go ahead and exit. I don't need to save any changes. We should start booting off this disk. All right, so let's go ahead and begin the smooth wall setup. And this pops us into a sexy NCurses based setup that's just going to go ahead and guide us through, ask us the questions to help us set up our uh, interfaces, our DHCP, the whole nine yards. First question is kind of superfluous. Uh, please insert the CD-ROM. Well, I think we booted off of it. So yeah, yeah, it, it's there. Now, it's going to let us know that this installation will format the hard drive. We're going to lose everything on it, whatever. It's uh, partitioning it now. And there you go. We've got it set up. Smoothwall has successfully installed to the hard drive. It's really just a matter of sitting around, waiting for it to do its thing. But when it's done, we now have this beautiful setup to walk us through the process of configuring our router. So before we even go into the web interface, let's just go ahead and take care of it here when we've got a monitor and keyboard hooked up to our lovely router here. Now it wants to know if we're going to restore our settings from a previous installation of Smoothwall. If this were the hack house, I probably would because we were running it there before. But no, this, this is a really nice feature to keep in mind because new versions come out all the time. This is 3.0. You know, we were on a 2x build at one point in time and it's just kind of nice to be able to bring those, all of your port forwards and all of those different network settings with you when you upgrade. But uh, we're not doing an upgrade so I'm going to say no. And it's going to ask about our keyboard layout. We're on the UK, I'm sorry, US, and machine's host name, Smoothwall, that's fine. And it's going to ask us how we want our outgoing traffic to be. Now, typically in older versions, everything's just been open, which means that your outgoing traffic uh, is not filtered in any particular way. Now, you can actually get really fine tuned here, but uh, what I'm going to do is since I'm going to want to create different rules later is I'm going to leave this open for now and then in a later segment we're going to go ahead and get nitty gritty with this. Now the incoming is still block everything if you didn't establish a connection or if you don't have you know, a server listening on the other end for it. 
So here we go. We go, need to configure the way that our uh, network cards are laid out. And this is where it gets colorful. So we're going to choose network configuration type. Now, green, green is going to be our home LAN. And that is this interface here on our Intel NIC. That's what's going to plug into, I don't know, like a 24 port gigabit and all of our devices into that. Uh, the red is the integrated NIC here, the Realtek, and that plugs directly into our modem. <clears throat> yes, our cable modem. So what it wants right now is like an ISDN modem. That's not what we need. We need a red and a green. Now, if you wanted to get all fancy, we could have a red, green, and an orange. We could even throw in purple. And all these different colors basically mean additional interfaces. If this weren't a mini ITX board, if I had more PCI cards to work with here, I could add, for example, a wireless card and turn this also into a wireless access point. Well, that's probably what we're going to do with this a little bit later on. But suffice it to say, those are uh, the different network topologies that we can work with here in SmoothWall. Like we can even do, you know, like purple is a DMZ if we have servers that we want to have on a separate VLAN, kind of structure it that way. Uh, but let's just go ahead and go with our green and our red. So we need to assign our cards to those colors, those interfaces, if you will. So uh, let's assign those. And we're going to go ahead and go ahead and configure these. So we will probe, and it's going to go ahead and search for new hardware, and it detected our uh, Pro 1000. This is our Intel one, so we're going to say yes. Let's go ahead and assign the Intel one to green, because that's our LAN. I'm going to probe again, and it found the Realtek 8169. That's the integrated on our red, so that's the only one it could be is red. And then all cards have been assigned. So now we can actually change our address settings. Now the address settings for green are going to be DHCP. Basically, this will act as a DHCP server. That is to say, it's going to allow other devices on the network and say, here's your IP address. Here's all of the DNS information. Welcome to the network. And for it to do that, to make things simple, we're just going to go with a basic address scheme of 192.168.0.1. We could also do like a 172.16. something. something, or a 10. something. 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 It really just depends on how many uh, devices we're going to have on the network. Depends on what class of network we do. And considering that this house is never going to have more than 200 and something odd uh, devices, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it with these defaults. But if you want to get really, you know, crazy here, you can. Uh, further reading in the show notes about CIDR nets and stuff like that. And if that's really what you guys want to hear about on the show, let me know, because we could do that all day long. OK, and then we'll choose for our red. And our red is going to be DHCP, because that's what we get from our cable modem. So we're going to say, hey, cable modem, I'm the router out in this place. Hook me up. Or if you need PPOE, if you're on a DSL, or if a static IP address provided by your ISP, you know, that's where you would enter that. So now that we've assigned both of those, I'll hit done. And last but not least, we can set up our DNS and gateway settings. Uh, I like the 8.8.8.8 DNS server. That's the new one by Google. I find that pretty good. You could also use, I don't know, 4.2.2.2 is a good one. There's tons of DNS out there. I'm sure your ISP provides one. I find a lot of the bigger ISP ones kind of annoying now when they start futzing with like your results when you biff a URL. So, or there's open DNS we've talked about in the fourth season. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead with these and say we're done. Now here's where I could configure a web proxy if I had to do that. If this was sitting behind another proxy, we don't need to worry about that in this particular configuration. Um, we are going to go down to DHCP, though, and enable this. So now that means on our green interface, it's going to run as a DHCP server. It's going to start assigning addresses at 192.168.0.100 all the way to 200. So that'll give us a big enough address pool for the devices that will potentially connect by DHCP to this network. And what I like to do in this instance is since it begins at 100 and goes to 200, I'll keep all of my servers, all my static gear at under 100. So, you know, like some of my Skype boxes will be like 80 something, 82, whatever. 
So I'll come down here, hit OK, and finish. Now we'll set a password. I'm just going to do something real simple for now. And setup is complete. We're going to go ahead and reboot. That's all there is to configuring a smooth wall setup. And once this reboots, basically from any you know, device on our LAN, I can come to my laptop here. And what you want to do is hit that IP address, that one that we configured in one of those steps where it was the green interface, the 192.168.0.1. That's our gateway. That's this machine right here. We're going to want to pull up our browser and head over to HTTP colon slash slash that IP colon 81. That is to say port 81, not the standard port 80. If it was port 80, we wouldn't need to do colon 80. That would just be, you know, accepted as the default. But that's what we would get if, uh, uh, that's what we have to do to get to the web admin interface because they, they use the 81. I think we established that. So anyway, you would just go ahead and log in with the credentials that I just gave it. And from there, we can, get a, we can have a ton of fun just tweaking all sorts of things about quality of service and proxies and ca you know, squid caching, uh, real-time antivirus, and a lot of other stuff. So look forward to more playing with Smoothwall in the future. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say about this. Uh, you know, this is the kind of projects that you like to see. Let us know, feedback at hack5.org if you have any other questions. And of course, don't forget to hit up those show notes. So we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be back in just a bit. Netflix delivers movies directly to your home, saving you time, money, and hassle. As a Netflix Unlimited member, you get DVDs by mail in about one business day. Plus, you can instantly watch thousands of TV episodes and movies, stream directly to your PC, Mac, or right to your TV via a Netflix-ready device like the Xbox 360, PS3, and the Nintendo Wii console. Watch as many movies as you want. Shipping is free, and there are never any late fees or no due dates. Keep the movies as long as you like. DVDs by mail, plus instantly right to your TV. Get unlimited movies two ways for only $8.99 a month. As a new member and a Hack5 viewer, you can get a free trial membership. Go to www.netflix.com slash hack5 and sign up now. Be sure to use this URL so that they know we sent you. If you've got the techno less like Martin with his teensy powered USB rubber ducky complete with a, a LCD display? Really? That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. All right, that's Techno Lust right there. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed. Send your pictures over to feedback at hack5.org and who knows, maybe we'll show off your picture next week. And don't forget, we have some sweet new hack packs over at hack5.org slash store. And the easiest and fastest way to support your favorite podcast is by going over to iTunes and YouTube and subscribing. Next week, Darren and Jen Cutter are getting together over at E3 to check out the newest and greatest in the gaming industry. Make sure to follow them on Twitter and Facebook for all of the latest. Until next week, I'm Shannon Morris. Remember to trust your techno lust. Pew, pew, pew. Innovative online, my mom's computer is on, and you can hear the fan. Crap, let's start that over. Big box of nuts, I love that. All right, there's a big box of nuts up in this house. All right, well, in that case, scrap that new piece of plexi, and I'm just going to cut it to however I want it. I open up the dot. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're around here. Oh, oh, Scrooge a bit. Itty bitty Scrooge a bit. Here, these blue lights are making me hot. Whew. All right. I'm dying. Is that a bug? Really? Oh, that really is a bug. Ew, it's a spider. It's hanging from the ceiling. Oh, God. I'll be right back. <laughs> Righty tighty lefty Lucy. Woo! Woo Allah. Woo Allah. Woo! Woo Allah. Alright. Stop this. Bad shit. Bad.
Do your job. Right. They're all slippery now that they've got so much makeup on them. Yes, you're a pretty screw. You're a pretty screw. Leave the cockroach in here for me. I appreciate it. Maybe Kirby will eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Kirby. Come on. It's a Kirby snack. <laughs>